Okay, I think we're going. We'll give it a try. Okay, uh, here, let's uh, get started. Let's say first. Father, thank you for bringing us together tonight. Thank you for this opportunity to share your wonderful revelation, to open our hearts and minds. Michael, Jesus, Nazareth. Amen. Um, there is, yeah, a like a reverberation or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's reverberation. Yeah. yeah, I've got everything off on the other computer, so not sure why that is. We're going to keep going. Maybe it'll stop. Okay. All right. Would you take that first paragraph, dear? I will. I wasn't muted, honey, before. Would that have been the reason that was malfunctioning? Yeah. Okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll mute it after I finish. Okay. All right. The first struggles between the expanding Roman and Parthian, Parthian, Parth I can't say it, Parthian, Parthian, Parthian. Parthian thank you, <laughs> states, had been concluded in the then recent past, leaving Syria in the hands of the Romans. In the times of Jesus, Palestine and Syria were enjoying a period of prosperity, relative peace, and extensive commercial intercourse with the lands to both the east and the west. Okay, so during this period of time, um, too soon. Um, the first struggles between Rome and Parthia uh, had been con con concluded in the really right before Jesus was born, and so Syria was in char in the hands of Rome, just like uh, it was during the entire time of Jesus's life. So, because of that, all the uh, lands around him was fairly peaceful. So that allowed Jesus to be able to travel with his not only with his family, but when he uh, actually uh, went to Rome later on in his life, right? Remember the trip to Rome? Yeah. So uh, that that allowed that to happen. It's because of this relatively relative peace uh, between Rome and Parthia that this could uh, could happen because all the all the trade pathways and everything like that was open at that point. Okay. Number two, the Jewish people. Uh, Letch, would you take the next one, please? Okay. Uh, the Jewish people. The Jews were a part of the older Semitic race, which also included the Babylonians, the Phoenicians, and the more recent enemies of Rome, the Carthaginians. During the forepart of the first century after Christ, the Jews were the most influential group of the Semitic peoples, and they happened to occupy a peculiarly strategic geographic position in the world as it was at that time ruled and organized for trade. It was ruled by Rome, right? So yeah. that's, that's why that was the case. Now, it's interesting because some of their governors in all these areas were what? They were Jews, okay? So that allowed uh, the peace to keep going. Of course, the Jews felt like they were oppressed all the time by the by the Romans, but it was because of the Romans that they had relatively peace, because up to that point, they had been warring with the other tribes constantly, just like they are today, right? They're still warring with, with other groups of people, and the, the Middle East constantly has never stopped, all right? Okay, Rodney, would you take the next one, please? Yes. Many of the great highways joining the nations of antiquity passed through Palestine, which thus became the meeting place or crossroads of three continents. <clears throat> the travel, trade, and armies of Babylonia, Assyria, Egypt, Syria, Greece, Parthia, and Rome successfully swept over Palestine. From time immemorable, many caravan routes 
from the Orient pass through some part of this region to the few good seaports of the eastern end of the Mediterranean, when ships carried their cargoes to all the maritime Occident. And more than half of this caravan traffic passed through or near the little town of Nazareth in Galilee. Remember in Jesus's life, his dad had a shop to service the caravans. Remember that? You know, they did tents and roping and stuff like that. And so that this gave, this is what they're talking about. All of these caravans came through Nazareth. So it gave Jesus the opportunity to interact with a lot of different cultures. Jesus spoke seven languages. So he could easily communicate with all those that were coming through Palestine and through through Nazareth itself. Okay, so it was like the perfect place for him to grow up, and he gained this experience. All right. Julius, would you like to read? It's up to you. You don't have to. It's totally up to you. Okay. Although Palestine was the home of the Jewish religious culture and the birth of Christ of Christianity, the Jews were abroad in the world during many nations and trading in every province of the Roman. And okay, so because they traded with all these different cultures constantly, the Jews traded with the, the Orient, they traded with the Occident, they traded all the way around. So they got, they not, they not only got rich from that, you know, from the, from the merchant, er, merchandise trade, but uh, they got to be friends with a lot of different type of people. Now, the funny thing about that is even today, uh, in Palestine, they don't trade as well as they did back in Jesus's time, which is almost hard to believe if you think about it, right? Because, you know, they're constantly warring with their neighbors and that sort of thing. And, and when you have wars that go on and on and on and on, of course, it's hard to be friendly with someone. Okay. And that's exactly what happened. So, <coughs> all right, Diane, you want to take the next one, Jim? Greece provided a language and a culture. Rome built the roads and unified an empire. But the dispersion of the Jews with their more than 200 synagogues and well-organized religious communities scattered hither and yon throughout the Roman world provided the cultural centers in which the new gospel of the kingdom of heaven found initial reception and from which it sub subsequently spread to the uttermost parts of the world. Okay, so it, it seems from what they, they tell us that Greece or the, uh, the Greek culture was the main language uh, of this area, okay, because, that, because of trade, things like that. Another important point here is the 200 synagogues. So when Jesus first started his preaching, they, all these synagogues were open to him to go and preach and talk to people and that sort of thing. Of course, soon after that, uh, they closed them all down to not only him, but the Christians too. So that's when the Christians had to start uh, meeting in their own places. Uh, but it was nice that they were there to begin with. Um, uh, Lech, would you take the next one? <coughs> okay. uh, each Jewish synagogue tolerated a fringe of Gentile believers, devout or God-fearing men, and it was among this fringe of proselytes that Paul made the bulk of the early, his early converts to Christianity. Even the temple at Jerusalem possessed its ornate court of the Gentiles. There was very close connection between the culture, commerce, and worship of Jerusalem and Antioch. In Antioch, Paul's disciples were first called Christians. Okay, so the early converts to Christianity were mostly made up of Gentiles and slaves. Now, you got to remember that almost uh, over half of the population in the Roman times were considered slaves. Okay, so slavery was 
just a thing that's been around since the beginning of time. And we're not talking about just black slaves. We're talking about white slaves, Jews. All these people were considered slaves because they were conquered by Rome. That makes sense. So soon as uh, one comp one group of people conquered another, they became slaves of those who had conquered them. So slaves have been around forever. But it's interesting that a good percentage of the early converts to Christianity were not Jews. They were actually Gentiles. And that was part of the slave population or the Gentiles. OK, and it's interesting here, too, because they say they say in this paragraph, these were devout and God fearing men. And that's why Paul was able to make converts of them. They already believed in God the Father. They just didn't understand God the Father with the brotherhood of man concept. Okay, so that's that's why it was easier to convert them to uh, Christianity. And it's uh, Antioch was the first part place where they were first called Christians, and Antioch was the place where Paul came from. Okay. Uh, right. The centralization of the Jewish temple worship at Jerusalem constituted alike the secret of the survival of their monothe mono monotheism. Monotheism, that's right. And the promise uh, of the nurture and sending forth to the world of a new and a large concept of that one God of all nations and father of all mortals. The temple service at Jerusalem represented the survival of a religious culture, cultural concept in the face of the downfall of a success, succession of Gentile national overlords and racial persecutors. Okay, so it's interesting to see that they say right here this uh, in this bottom of this paragraph that the downfall uh, of the Gentiles, uh, the national overlords, it, it was a racial thing. Okay, so uh, just like people during World War II hated the Jews, back then they were the Jews were hated and the Gentiles were hated in a different way. Okay, so this is an ongoing thing of racial hate between one group and another. We're not talking about we're not talking about the different races between black or white or or uh, like olive skin for like India and places like that. We're talking about racial hate because of what they believe. Okay, so you could think of it as religious prosecute persecution. Okay. And we got to keep in mind this is all reason we're talking about all this, this is the atmosphere that Jesus was born in, right? Julius, would you take the next one, please? Can you hear me, Julius? Julius? Okay, the Jewish people of this time, although under Roman sovereignty, they enjoyed a considerable degree of self government and remembering them on the recent heroic exploits of deliverance achieved by Judas, Chikebe, and his immediate successors were vibrant with the expectation of the immediate appearance of a still greater deliverer, the long expected Messiah. Okay, so the long expected Messiah was not Jesus's personality, was it? Okay, Jesus was a peacemaker. They were looking for a warlord overlord, right? So they were looking for somebody that was militarily strong so they could take back all their land and that sort of thing. So they're, they were looking at another King David or someone like that to come and take back over everything. So when Jesus showed up, and fit the bill of a messiah but not a military messiah it upset him basically okay 
And so that's why it's, you're going to find out when we study a little bit further along in the life of Jesus, Jesus did not feel like he was this coming Messiah to start out with because he was not militarily inclined to that, right? Because he understood this fact of this military Messiah. Roger? Yeah. I've been meaning to look it up, but Judas Maccabee, what, what was he? He was, he was, a re, he, was uh, he started a rebellion against Rome. Okay. okay. So he, he was a Jewish military uh, general in essence. Okay. So that's, that's why, you know, his, the whole story of him and him getting killed and all the people that got killed with him and stuff. This was all a Roman rebellion. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay, here. This is a long one, dear. It's yours. I'll have to ask you how to hmm. pronounce a few words there. The Secret of the Survival of Palestine, the Kingdom of the Jews, as a semi independent state, was wrapped up in the foreign policy of the Roman government, which desired to maintain control of the Palestinian highway of travel between Syria and Egypt as well as the western terminals of the caravan routes between the Orient and the Occident. Rome did not wish any power to arise in the Levant, which might curb her future expansion in these regions. The policy of intrigue, which had for its object the pitting of cellulid Syria and ha ha ha, Total man, huh? Cell you said. what did I say? Yeah. <laughs> okay. And uh, Ptolemaea, Egypt, Ptolemaea, Egypt against each other necessitated fostering Palestine as a separate and independent state. Roman policy, the degeneration of Egypt, and the progressive weakening of the Seleucid. So yeah, whatever, whatever, whatever. Seleucids, um before Seleucid. the Seleucids. How am I supposed to know that? <laughs> I thought it was um, before the rising power of Parthenium. Explain why it was that for several generations a small and unpowerful group of Jews was able to maintain its independence against both Seleucid. I'm going to yeah. skip that word <laughs> to the north and the, the Poliomites to the south. This uh, fortuitous, fortuitous liberty and independence of the political rule of surrounding and more powerful people, the Jews attributed to the fact that they were the chosen people to the d direct interposition of Yahweh. Such an attitude of racial superiority made it all the harder for them to endure Roman Suzerainty, when it finally fell upon their hand, their land. But even in that sad hour, the Jews refused to learn that their world mission was spiritual, not political. <laughs> Why were they considered the chosen people? That was because of Melchizedek, right? Mm -hmm. Melchizedek and Abraham. That's how this whole concept of the chosen people. Uh, the the deal was. God would do everything if his people would just believe in him, right? That was the deal. And that would make them the chosen people to take the, the message that God the Father was their father onward. That's what the whole chosen people is about. Okay. Well, shortly after that, Moses comes along and gives them 420 laws, you know, <laughs> which kind of ties them up pretty good, so. But they were still considered the chosen people, and that's why Jesus appeared among the Jews. Okay, let's keep going. Um, Fletch, would you take the next one, please? Okay. Uh, the Jews were unusually apprehensive and suspicious during the times of Jesus because they were then ruled by an outsider, Herod the Edomian who had seized the overlordship of Judea by cleverly ingratiating himself with the Roman rulers. And though Herod professed loyalty to the Hebrew 
ceremonial observations, he proceeded to build temples for many strange gods. So Herod being a Jew uh, by birth uh, did try to keep some of the Jewish customs going in his, in his kingdom, but he also wanted to keep the Jewish rulers happy so that they would keep him in, right? Political stuff. So he built all these strange temples. So for every temple he built for the Jews, he, dealt, he built a, a, another temple for the Romans and their gods, okay? And hmm. which brings up an interesting fact. Uh, let me tell you all a little story about how all these Roman gods came into being, which many people don't know. Every time I watch ancient aliens on TV, I get mad and want to throw something at the TV, okay? Because mm -hmm. they try to explain where the Romans got all these gods and stuff. So I'm going to tell you what really happened real quick. Is that okay with y'all? Yeah. Okay. During the Caligastia 100, okay, when 60 of the Caligastia 100 rebelled, okay, when they did, they, they took uh, 40, 000, over 40,000 of the midwayers with them, okay? So we know what the midwayers are, right? They were outside human eye, eyesight and that sort of thing. But when the Caligastia 100 came to the planet, they got their bodies and their DNA from the local inhabitants of the planet, okay? The better ones. All right, so the the surgeons of Avalon m manufactured these bodies for these this Caligastia 100. They were like eight feet tall, very large, but they used the DNA of the local inhabitants. When they did this, the inhabitants that donated their DNA for this to be done was also in circuited in the local universe circuit, okay? So as long as the Caligastia 100 and the 100 volunteers that gave their DNA, as long as they stayed loyal, they could eat of the tree of life and they would live indefinitely, okay? When they rebelled, what happened? They were cut off from the circuit and the tree of life. So they could, if they literally, ate the tree of life, it wouldn't do anything for them anymore because they weren't circuited anymore. An interesting point is this, all of them had this violet hue to them because of being inside the circuit. So when 60 of them rebelled and at least 60 of the, the beings that give the DNA rebelled with them, they left the garden, went up north. And this was following under the tutelages of Nod, okay? And that's why they called it the land of Nod. And eventually their children, we were called Nodites, okay? The reason I'm telling you this long drawn out story is this, the Nodites, which were the, Cali the 60 of the Caligasha 100 and their children started mating with the local inhabitants, human beings, okay? Also, the 60 that were given the, taken the DNA from, they made it with the Nodites, okay? So, these legends came up about these magnificent beings, which were the 60, okay, that had all these different, not really powers, but different, they were like superhumans. And so, they called them the Nephium, which is a combination of Nodites and seraphim, because at that time, a large number of seraphim rebelled with the Caligastra 100. So it got confused. The local inhabitants couldn't tell the difference between a seraphim and a Caligastra 100 being, okay? They just knew they had these superpowers. So as their children came along, they were called the Nephium, okay? And that's where ancient aliens gets really confused. So I wanted to make that clear. Now, these Nephian, not, uh, well, there was one other factor there too. The Midwayers that rebelled, they told stories about them, myths about them, about how they were considered watchers because they don't die. 
Okay, so these watchers went down through time, you know, 500,000 years. So that's where the watchers came from. The Nephilim were different than the watchers. And the ancient aliens, they think they're the same thing. They're not. They're two different types of beings. Okay, but these legends of these beings went down through time, 500,000 years till the time of Adam and Eve. And then what happened with Adam and Eve? Adam and Eve, we had the secondary midwayers, right? With their children, Adam, son, and Rada, who was the last descendant of what? The Nodites. Okay, so she had some of that blood left in her when she married Adamson. Well, when they married every fourth child, the first 16 children were semi-invisible. They weren't visible to human beings. They, they could see them, but nobody else could. So that's where the first 16 secondary midwayers came from. So they took those children, 16 couples or eight couples, uh, 16 all together, and they mated them together, and that's where each couple had 256 midwayers, which were invisible. And the difference was this. The first 16 midwayers that were created by Adamson and Rada had normal lifespans. They died just like their mom and dad did. But the 256 that each couple had did not die. They lived indefinitely because they were in circuited by the spiritual circuit of the Adam, uh, of Adam's son. Okay, so those beings continue to live forever. They don't eat, they don't sleep, they don't need to because they, they get their energy from the energy system of the cosmos. Okay, so that's why they live forever. They're still on the, the planet, the, the, the loyal ones are. Okay, so why did I tell you this long story? Because all these Roman gods were the leftover stories and myths about not only the Nephium, the Nodites, but also the Midwayers. So that's where all these concepts of gods and Olympus and Hercules and all these other things came from. You Sounds me? like uh, Greek mythology, huh? That's exactly what it is. But you see the connection? You see where these Greek mythologies came from? They came from the stories originate from the first garden and the second garden about these Greek gods. They were descendants of these people, okay? Yeah, and the Romans gave them different names. Yeah, that's the right. The Romans, yeah, gave them different names. It's the same stories, but they just give them different names. Y'all, mm. y'all follow me? Like Jupiter, like Jupiter, right. Hercules, oh. Thor. Oh. Yeah. So this is where all this comes from. Now, this is why this paragraph. This is where this paragraph comes in. The Jewish rulers knew these stories about the garden and all this other stuff that had been passed down through them through centuries and centuries and centuries, right? So in order to keep the Greeks happy and the Romans happy, that's why they developed these temples that they knew these gods were not gods at all. They were just human beings descended from these early people. You follow me? Mm. But they turned them into what? Gods. <clears throat> You follow me? I understand. Makes sense? Makes sense? All right. Long, long explanation, but that's where, that's why Herod and his son uh, also did the same things. They tried to keep the Romans happy and the Greeks happy. Uh, Is this the same Herod that created the city of Caesarea? Uh, same exact one. Okay. Sure okay. Now, uh, let's, who, who just read? I don't remember who's read. Did you just read? Less did. Okay, well, you're up then. I did. Oh. <clears throat> the friendly relations of Herod with the Roman rulers made the world safe for Jewish travel and thus opened the way for increased Jewish penetration, even of distant portions of the Roman Empire and of foreign treaty na nations with the new gospel 
of the kingdom of heaven. Herod's reign also contributed much toward the further blending of Hebrew and Hellenistic philosophies. Okay, so we're going to, they end up blending the Greek concepts of philosophy, you know, mostly play, pe people like Plato, and we're going to go through these uh, in section four. They blend that with the Hebrew beliefs, okay, and try to mesh it all together in one thing, okay? So that's what they're talking about here. And they, in reality, they don't blend when it comes right down to it. Well, okay. isn't that what uh, Philo did? Yeah, Philo. Yeah, he. that's exactly, yeah, that's what he did, okay? okay. Socrates, uh, Philo, uh, all those before, that, that was about 400 years before Jesus. So they tried to combine all these things and come up with a philosophy for the Romans and the Greeks that's compatible to what was going on during that time right before Jesus was, was born, right? About 400 years before he was born. Okay. Very complicated, but there's a lot to it. Okay, Julius, would you take the next one, please? We have uh, of the first Yahoo Father Aided in making based on the crossroads of the civilized world. Uh, he died in 4 BC, and his son Herod Atticus governed the Galilee and there during Jesus' use and ministry AD 39. Antipas, like his father, was a great builder. He rebuilt many of the cities of Galilee including the important trade center of Sepphoris. Sepphoris, that's right. Now, there, there it is, Les, you were talking about earlier. There's the harbor of Caesar, Caesarea that yeah. the elder Herod built, right? But his son also built a bunch of stuff for the Romans after that, mm -hmm. uh, which included the trade center at Sepphoris. But uh, remember, too, that... Um, during Jesus's youth, it was Antipas that Jesus had the falling out over collecting his father's earnings. You remember that story later on? Mm -hmm. uh, Jesus went to, to Antipas to try to collect monies owed to his family for the, the work his, his father did, he would pay. So that's why he called Antipas the, the, the Riley Fox for outfoxing him on his, his money that his dad was owed. So, hmm. right. uh, Diane. The Galileans were not regarded with full muted, dear. Sorry. I could hear her though. That was weird. Yeah. The Galileans were not regarded with full favor by the Jerusalem religious leaders and rabbinical teachers. Galilee was more gen Gentile than Jewish when Jesus was born. Mm. Oh, okay, so Jesus grew up in an area that was con considered more Gentile than it was Jewish, as far as the families go, that sort of thing. Sounds like predator. Oh, predator. Yeah. Y'all, I hate, I hate to tell you this, but I got to run for a second. So y'all read this paragraph. I'll be right back. Okay. Medicine I'm taking. Okay. Excuse I think it's latches. Go ahead, Marie. Uh, I think among, okay, I'll go. Uh, among the Gentiles, although the social and economic condition of the Roman state was not of the highest order, the widespread domestic peace and prosperity was propitious for the bestowal of Michael. In the first century after Christ, the society of the Mediterranean world consisted of five well-defined strata. Hmm. Which I think we're about to find out. Mm -hmm. Julius, what's the temperature where you are? Is it hot? 
Julius, is it hot there or cold? I don't think he can hear you. No. I can barely hear him when he's speaking. It's amazing that um, we can have a Zoom meeting with someone on the other side of the world. I know it is. <clears throat> And his picture's so clear, too. Yeah. I mean, when we were growing up, this was way beyond even Star Trek, you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. No kidding. When the iPhone has more memory than all the computers in the 60s all put together. It's amazing. <laughs> Uh, Y'all read that paragraph? Yeah. Lutch did. Uh, Lutch did. Yeah. Okay. Did you explain it too, Lutch? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. I think that's self explanatory, isn't it? Okay. Let's go on to the next one. This is a big one. Rodney, you get this one. <laughs> okay. Surely I'm going to mispronounce something. That's yeah. fine. We'll help you out. Sorry about that, y'all. I'm, I'm on all these pain meds. Oh, I understand. You know. But the aristocracy. Aristocracy. Thank you. The sure. aristocracy. <laughs> The upper classes with money and official power, the privileged and ruling groups, also the business groups, who are the merchant princes and the bankers, the traders, the big importers and exporters, the international merchants. We also had the middle, small middle class, although this group was indeed small, it was very influential and provided the moral backbone of the early Christian church, which encouraged these groups to continue in their various crafts and trades. Among the Jews, many of the Pharisees belonged to this class of tradesmen. Also, we had the, there was the free Proletarian? Oh, yeah, that's good. Proletariat, yes. Proletariat. Mm -hmm. This group had little or no social standing. Though proud of their freedom, they were placed at great disadvantage because they were forced to compete with slave labor. The upper classes regarded, regarded them disdainfully allowing that they were useless, except for, quote, breeding purposes. And then also, lastly, we had the slaves. Half the population of the Roman state were slaves. Many were superior individuals and quickly made their way up among the free proletariat and even among the tradesmen. The majority of either mediocre, or the majority were either mediocre or very inferior. Okay, so let me go back to this last. Now this is what I was wanting to point out. These five areas they just explained to us are the five well-defined strata. That's what I'm going to make out of this. Okay, so these five groups, you belonged to one of the five. There's no, no way around it. Uh, 
you know, from childhood all the way up through adulthood, you were part of one of these five groups. And they have what? The aristocracy, which is the, the money people, the ruling group, you know? This is what we call our politicians nowadays, right? These are the guys yeah. with the money that run everything, okay? And then you have the business group, and these are the group guys that work their way up from different things and become very powerful, powerful because of their trade capability and things like that. So as their business grew, their power grew. So they become a whole different class. Now, this is different than the aristocracy who are usually just the privileged class, okay? The business group, we're all working people, okay? Then the middle class, which is probably part of 90% of America is considered the middle class. You know, we're the guys that get out and work and do things, build things and that sort of thing, right? And then they had uh, in the free proletariat, they had uh, people that had no social standing like the aristocracy and they didn't own businesses, but they were forced to compete with slave labor just to get jobs, okay? So you can think of that today, we are pretty much the middle class, that's what we are. We're in between the middle class and the free pro proletariat because we're constantly uh, competing to get jobs for people that come into the country illegally and things like that, that will do them for almost nothing because they wanna stay in the country. Right. So that's kind of where we fit in today. And then the slaves and the sl we don't have any, quote, quote, technical slaves anymore. But we do have slaves in the sense that we have people that enslave men, women and children as sex slaves. Yeah. Okay? And that's that's what's going on today. That's still the case. So in every age, there's been some kind of slavery and it's still going on today. OK, so that's that's the five groups. And those five groups are pretty much still here. Any way you look at it. It's yeah. awesome. Right. We just call it something a little different. All right. Now, I would say that we're still enslaved to corporations. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. You can't get ahead no matter what. you. It's kind of like that. If you think about it, think about the coal mining days in uh, Kentucky and Tennessee, places like that, right? You would go to work, they'd send you to work in the mines, but then you'd have to buy all your food, all your clothing, everything you needed to live from the stores of the owners of the mines. So you never got out of debt to the mines. So you worked literally for, for your food. That's it, you know? So, and that went well, on for- It is anymore. Uh, Two days ago, I went to the store, seventy dollars for a bag of groceries. Yeah, mm -hmm. seventy dollars. It's like yeah, Phew. crazy, yeah. crazy. All right, uh, we lost Julius. So Diane, <laughs> you there he is. Wait a minute, he's back there. Julius, would you take the next one? Even in period because it was a visa of Roman military conquest, the power of the master over his slave was unqualified. The Christian church was largely composed of the lower classes and these slaves. Okay, so the Roman military, once they conquered a people, those people become flood slaves, okay? It's pretty much the same. Now, it's like Let's said just a minute ago, now it's, it's uh, big corporations. They conquer the people by keeping them enslaved and not paying them enough to get out of this, this daily slavery, okay? Right. And then we had the slavery of, well, Julius is real familiar with this, the, the African people, right? not only the blacks, but the whites and the Jews, right, of Africa. Uh, and in the last 300 years, you know, look at how many black people were enslaved and brought to this country against their will. It's the same principle. It's this con uh, conquest of military power. The, these 
pirates would go over and they would literally drag people out of their their huts and things like that in their little towns and put them on ships against their will and make them slaves. And that was the case in this country for 200 years, right? Um, all right, and uh, that that is still kind of going on in a different way, not only the slavery of children, women and children for sex slaves, but still people bring slaves into this country to do stuff like the Hispanics to do chores and things like that, you know, uh, get, uh, you know, get all the vegetables and fruits out of the fields and that sort of stuff. In reality, that's a way of slavery, any way you look at it. So it still goes on. The whole, the whole world is not free yet, not by a long shot. And this mm -hmm. is just a picture of Rome during that time. All right, so. What does it say? We're all slaves to something? Right. Yeah. Okay. Superior slaves. Uh, Diane, would you take this one? Superior slaves often received wages and by saving their earnings were able to purchase their freedom. Many such emancipated slaves rose to high positions in state, church, and the business world. And it was just such possibilities that made the early Christian church so tolerant of this modified form of slavery. Okay, so that that went on even in the, uh, you know, you remember during the Civil War, the North, many of the, the black slaves would go to the North and purchase their freedom uh, so that they could get out of the oppressiveness of the, of the Southern plantations and that sort of thing. So uh, it went on for a long time. And now, what do we have? We have women and children trying to purchase their freedom from these warlords and these overlords from other countries. So, still bad. Letch, would you take the next one? Okay. There was no widespread social problem in the Roman Empire in the first century after Christ. The major portion of the populace regarded themselves as belonging in that group into which they chanced to be born. There was always the open door through which talented and able individuals could ascend from the lower to the higher strata of Roman society. But the people were generally content with their social rank. They were not class conscious. Neither did they look upon these class distinctions as being unjust or wrong. Christianity was in no sense an economic movement having for its purpose the amelioration of the miseries of the depressed classes. So when people were born into these classes, they thought this was normal, right? This is just the way it is. And, mm -hmm. it, you know, that some things don't change that much. When we're grown, born into things in, in our lifetime, we kind of grow up the same way you know if you grow up poor i mean if you're born poor you grow up poor it's not until you reach your teens or early adulthood does it dawn on you that you can get out of the class that you were born in right so right. some things don't change all right um Roddy, you out there no julius will you take the next one then we lost Roddy there women enjoyed the more freedom throughout the Roman Empire than in her respected position in Palestine, the family devotion and the natural affection of the Jews far transcended that of the Gentile world. So before Jesus came, women were depressed, were repressed just like they are still today in many things, right? But Jesus tried to change that and bring women up e equal to uh, men during his time in the world. Okay, number four, Gentile philosophy. I know y'all, this is going a totally different direction from here, so I think we're going to quit here and bring take this one up next time. So it's a consistent story. And this, in this one, I'm going to show you something Next week, when we meet on Sunday, we got some pictures of the philosophers and things like that during this time. So I'm going to show you the cynics and the stoics, and that sort of thing, Plato. Okay. 
kind of bring it all together. So we'll have a pretty good picture of what was going on right before Jesus was born, okay, in the world. So let's have a little prayer, and we will quit for tonight. Uh, Rodney, would you like to close us in prayer? Since you didn't get to read that last time. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the opportunity that we've had to come together this Sunday morning to study the Urantia book and uh, to learn about the times of your son's bestowal on our planet. Father, we thank you very much that Roger has the ability to more fully explain uh, what we're reading so we can understand it with a, uh, better. And uh, Father, we, we say all this in the name of your son, uh, Michael Navadon, Jesus of Nazareth, amen. Amen. And thank you all at home for coming to join us. Uh, please come see us again. We'd love to see you. Right, let me start.